Welcome to the Vandy Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Lee. Our guest today, Mitch Light of The Athletic. We thank our presenting sponsor, Wellspire, Nashville's Learning and Development Center. Wellspire offers personal and professional development opportunities in a beautiful facility in the Gulch neighborhood. Stop by for an event with world-renowned speakers or host an off-site event that will wow your team or your clients. We thank our co-presenting sponsor, the Well Coffee House, which turns coffee into water and has a mission to bring clean water to the world. Today's news is brought to you by Sutherland & Belk, a Nashville-based injury law firm. Sutherland & Belk is committed to fighting for those who have been injured in car, motorcycle, and truck accidents. Check them out at sbinjurylaw.com. Good news for Vanderbilt basketball. The Commodores have announced the addition of Isaac McBride to the basketball roster. McBride was at Kansas last year, never played. His eligibility in terms of when the clock starts and when he can play at Vanderbilt has not yet been determined. Mitch Light appears on our guest line, brought to you by Bowl and Branch, which was started by Vanderbilt graduates Scott and Missy Tannen. I had no clue what I was missing with Bowl and Branch sheets until I got them. They are fair trade certified, meaning they were made under safe conditions by men and women treated and paid fairly. Try them free for a month. You can return them, but you won't want to. Once you get the sheets, try the mattress, which was voted the best mattress of 2018. Go to bowlandbranch.com. That is spelled B-O-L-L. Enter the promo code VANDY and get $50 off your first set of sheets. Mitch Light joins us from The Athletic. Mitch, of course, is on the Vanderbilt radio team for football. Mitch, appreciate you joining us today, or today and how have you been? I'm good, Chris. Thanks for, thanks for having me. How is life at The Athletic, and what's the workload like these days? Pretty steady. Uh, it's good. Uh, working on uh, a project that will, will, it's done will be out tomorrow. We did um, the... 10 most dominant teams. We have, a, if you paid attention to Athletic this week, if you're a subscriber, that we do these blitzes where across the network in this week is like dominant teams. So in different towns and, you know, Boston, I saw the top 25 teams in Boston sports history, all pro sports, because that's pro, uh, uh, pro, you know, I don't think the BC team of 2008 that lost to Vanderbilt in the Music City Bowl made their list. Um, so we're doing the top 10 teams of, in the state of Tennessee over the last 50 years and pro in college, uh, not high school. That would have been a little too, too much. Um, but one thing it was sort of a cop out, but sort of not is we're only doing one representative from each team because quite frankly, there were seven Tennessee women's basketball teams that won the national championship. And it's like not a pro or anti Tennessee thing to, but do you really want to have a top 10 list with seven teams from one team, you know, one program. So, like Vanderbilt baseball might have had multiple teams represented, but we only have one Vanderbilt baseball team on there. There's only one Tennessee football team on there. So we have the top 10, and that will be out tomorrow. You know, speaking of Vandy baseball, that's in the back of my mind for what I want to do after the Vandy Sports 100 is count down the, the teams that I've covered over the three sports and go from worst to best. And baseball number one is really easy. It's last year's team because they yeah. won everything in sight. But I'm telling you, two through five or six or so is not easy at all. I mean, people no, would say the national title team in 2014, I think there was a couple teams that were probably better than them. It just sometimes it comes down to matchups and other things. But that's an, going to be, if I get to it, an excruciatingly tough list to pick. I, I agree because ha before we decided to, to cut this off at one representative from each team, <clears throat> and I was trying to figure out the second Vanderbilt team, you know, I've had this discussion. I've thought about this a lot. I, I think, I mean, it's sort of like beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Like how much do you value a championship? Um, I think it's, and I'll give you a good example. Well, this isn't a great example because they, they didn't win, but the Predators, like is the team that made the Stanley Cup final better then the team the next year that won the President's Trophy, uh, but lost in the second round. Like, how, you know, how, how do you v value all that? So what I, I value a championship, but it's not the be all end all. And I, I would not put the 2014 Vanderbilt team second. I think the 2013 Vanderbilt team is the second best for me. Uh, I think that 
Maybe the league it wasn't a great league year for the SEC, but I don't care. You win, you go twenty six and three in the SEC. That's incredible. So to me, uh, um, you know, obviously very talented team, but I would put that team over two thousand fourteen. I might put two thousand eleven, two thousand fifteen over two thousand fourteen. Although again, it's hard not to, you know, really put a lot of stock in that championship. I would put twenty eleven before any of those, and I will tell you why. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, that team did share a championship. It was twenty-two and eight. In a very of, good year, a very good SEC East. Yes, twenty fourteen. And look, I, I'm not saying any of this to take away from the twenty thirteen team, but that league that year was not as good. Twenty eleven was really good. If you remember, Vanderbilt, Florida, and South Carolina all tied for the title that year. And Vanderbilt made it to the finals of the SEC tournament, which I believe it got beat, I want to say 6 nothing by Florida in the final of that one, if my memory serves. But the thing that stood out about that, well, first of all, that team made it to the Final Four of the College World Series, again, along with South Carolina and Florida. I thought that team was grossly underseeded as a six, and consequently it got a bad matchup with the one team it could not beat, which was Florida. You change the brackets a little bit, maybe put them on South Carolina's side. Maybe that plays out differently. Who knows? But the thing that stuck out to me about that team is if you compared it with Florida and South Carolina, I want to say Vanderbilt's run differential in league play was like plus 140, and Florida and Carolina were like plus 60 that year. I mean, they were all the same record in conference, but the run differential, and again, I know that you don't play – the same teams all the time. In other words, maybe Carolina and Florida had a tougher schedule, or maybe it wasn't tougher. I don't know. But the run differential from that team was glaring. I don't know that I've ever seen a run differential in league play any team in the SEC ever since I've covered as high as that one put up that year. Yeah, I mean that's and that's the type of thing that when you really dive in and you got to put pen to paper or fingers to key keyboard, you you you, you know you got to be sure you have all your bases covered. I mean, we could look and see who the um, other cross division opponents were, but I'm looking Vanderbilt. I believe, yeah, didn't they? They they blew a, they lost in, to Florida head to head. They lost six five. They beat them fourteen one, and then I think blew the Sunday game. Lost six three. I don't remember the details, but I think blew that game. Um, you know, Vanderbilt played LSU, Alabama, and actually that was a good Alabama team that year. Their RPI was thirty two. They played Auburn, who was thirty nine. They played Arkansas, who was twelve. Played Mississippi State, who was sixteen. So it looks like Vanderbilt also played very good teams in, in the crossover schedule there too. So yeah, I mean it's it's a good debate to have. And uh, the team that we didn't mention that I think we all agree the 2007 team had as good a almost you know maybe maybe last year's team would have more, but great top end talent, but just not the overall roster depth uh, as some of the other better Corbin teams. Well, and I would also argue 2015 was better than 2014. Of course, the difference was. The 14 team won game three against Virginia. The 15 team did not. But that team was much better in league yes. play. And, of course, it was a lot of the same cast, just a year older. Yes, yes. And uh, speaking of baseball, I shouldn't mention that I didn't write the story. But later today or tomorrow morning, we're going to have a Vanderbilt baseball story in the athletic. You know, my, my story a couple uh, weeks ago, about a month ago, on, on Worth Scott's home run. Uh, but Josh Cooper, who went to Vanderbilt, he's one of our L.A.'s editors, went to Vanderbilt, graduated in like 2003 or four wrote a story about that that group of Corbin's first pl- early years players at core and how so many of them are in Major League Baseball right now, not as players, but as executives. And, and so it, that was a good story. I, I was involved editing that. So that will be published later today or tomorrow. Speaking of baseball, had things gone according to plan, the SEC tournament would have been starting today. Yeah, I was just – I saw that and I realized and I, you know, I usually try to go – with my son for at least a day, you know, a year. And I was trying to think if I would have tried to go today or, you know, how, how would have been, I think last year we went the first day because it's been played at night and it just worked out. So that's always been a fun trip. So just, it's, it's, it's amazing, you know, so far off the radar, you know, we've just been this past two, three months have just been conditioned now that there's just nothing going on. We're nothing to, nothing, we're, you know, not even expecting anything. Speaking of which, and, I know that in your world, you get your head and where you're involved. You may not be involved in this at all, but among your network of writers and people that you speak to at The Athletic, it seems when I 
survey the landscape that there will be a college football season, that it will start on time. Again, any of this can change day to day if an outbreak becomes a threat again. But what's your sense in talking to people of what's coming next for college football? I mean, kind of like that. I just the positive, which, you know, we didn't necessarily have a month ago or two, three weeks ago. But I'm with you. There's nothing, no guarantees. We, we Things sound good. They look good on paper. But if these kids start getting back to campus or these teams and there's an outbreak, then all bets are off. So hopefully it all works out. I mean, there's just for so many reasons I want it to work out, selfish reasons. And then for, for just everyone to, to get back to normalcy. But there's there's absolutely no guarantees right now. I think on the Vanderbilt end, they're going to be very careful. I think the model that people are going to go to is what South Carolina is doing, where they are, I guess, leaving at Thanksgiving. And I think I'm hearing at Vandy that they may come back mid-February because that's when people think there's going to be a spike. I've even heard that Vanderbilt is considering – renting hotel rooms or, or I don't I guess it would be renting I guess the school would do it in order to have one person per room in their dorms and so if that means accommodating kids who are on campus in a different way they'll do it but that's interesting apparently Vanderbilt has really thought this through in terms of exposure and distancing but that would be quite an expense if that's what it goes with yeah and then do they make like my family we live here would my would they send my daughter home you know, make her live at home. Um, if they're doing that, I hope not. No offense to Zoe, but you know, I, we, we're sending her off to college, not for her to live here. So <laughs> we'll see. But uh, yeah, we'll, you know, it's it's the uh, talking to people like just friends about all this. Uh, I don't envy the people in 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 the uh, who have to make these very difficult decisions. Just at the university level, high school, everything. There's just it's um, there's there's no there's no playbook for this. Well, the problem is, I mean, I think to me, it seems fairly manageable. Well, I, no, it really doesn't because you're dealing <laughs> with college kids. But I guess what I'm getting at, the people who are getting really sick are not that demographic, right? It's generally older people and such, but viruses mutate and those sorts of things. And you've always got to look at for your downside. And the downside of this you know, we look at it, we think we know where things are, but the downside if something goes wrong is enormous. And I think, I agree with you, I would not want to be the person having to make the decisions for that reason because the lawsuits if something went crazy wrong would be unbelievable. Yeah, and you know, it's not to get too far off the path here of a Vanderbilt Sports uh, podcast, but you know, things seem relatively normal. You know, I go to Publix other than, you know, wearing the mask and, you know, there's people shopping and you drive around and there's, you know, I'm not saying it's business as usual by any stretch, but I, I had a doctor's appointment the other day over at St. Thomas and going near a hospital, it looks more like a war zone. That's when it really hits that, you know, we're, things aren't really normal or close to normal. Um, and I realized that's a hospital, but that was the first time in a couple of weeks where I was just, it was almost jarring. Uh, about the the protocols and the procedures of the hospital, just parking and walking into the doctor's office, having my temperature taken. Like this is just going into the building, not to the actual doctor's office. So that was that was very interesting. Somebody said this to me, and you live in Nashville, and I live in Franklin, and I'm sure that one's environment has a lot to do with his or her opinion of this, because I think if essentially if you live in New York City, where it's kind of I hate to use the phrase, but almost ground zero for this sort of thing. There are differences in, in where you are and how the virus affects people. What I've been told, and I, I have not been in a Nashville really, I guess since it started, but in Franklin, it has much more of a feel of normal around here. I mean, you go into Kroger and you see maybe half the people wearing masks now, maybe half the people not. I would say that three or four weeks ago, it was 80 to 90% of people wearing masks. But it has to feel where I am that things are sort of back to normal. Not not quite, but more than they were. I heard Nashville, and this sounds like based on what you just said, it backs it up, is not quite where we are, perhaps. Yeah, it just depends on, you know, I live out in Bellevue again, my little shopping area near here, it seems relatively normal. I would say most people in public wear masks. Uh, we get takeout and depending on where you go, like we went to Taco Mama Cita yesterday, which is over by Vanderbilt and 
uh, got takeout there. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's just the only thing that really stood out to me was, was the doctor's office in the hospital. So I, I bet that if you went somewhere in Franklin, I bet it would be the same thing there with all the precautions necessary. I'm getting my hair cut for the first time since early March on Thursday. So I think my wife will very much appreciate that. Yeah, I would say my wife has cut my hair and my son's hair, which has actually gone better than I thought it would. I was a little dreading it at first, but I hate having my hair get long and thick. So I was I was really ready for you know I, I can wear hats. So in case there was any anything that went awry. Yeah, my wife has made the offer and I declined. And there's been a lot of hat wearing on my behalf lately yeah. for that reason too. But let's get back to sports. Eventful week for Vanderbilt basketball. It did not get Romella White for reasons I have outlined on previous podcasts. I think that is a blow to the current roster. Vanderbilt now has a scholarship left. A bit of good news, it did get Isaac McBride available for next year. Reviews on him have been very mixed depending on where they're coming from, but obviously a very skilled player out of high school was number 106, according to Rivals, was the Gatorade Player of the Year, and they played at a smaller Baptist school. So level of competition, who knows? Did not last long at Kansas, left or was kicked off, depending on who's telling the story, middle of September up there. But this will be an important reset for him. You're at Vanderbilt. I want to get into the roster for a minute, but as I think through the future of basketball, it is a guards game these days, and I think the McBride Tyron Lawrence combo, along with Scottie Pippen Jr., really is going to hold a lot of the keys to success for this program over the next two to three years. Yeah, I agree. And and we've talked a lot about this. Um, I I look at the roster now and I see more rostered probably depth than they've had in several years. I don't see a standout. Um, which they have had, whether it was, you know, uh, Aaron Neesmith for half the year, Saban Lee, obviously Darius Garland for half a year, uh, even going back a few years, you know, in Bryce Drew's first season, Luke Cornett. And some, so I see a roster right now that's a lot of really solid role players and not necessarily a lot of weaknesses. Like I think, you know, who, who knows on some of the, the true freshmen coming in, but, uh, you know, there, there's clearly not going to be a situation where you have three or three walk-ons on the floor at the same time next year or even any walk-ons. Um, you, you look at the depth, uh, projected depth chart again. I think there's a lot of solid college basketball players out there. The concern is right now who's who's going to stand out, who's going to take that step. And that's my point. Previous podcast with you, Chris, is Dylan DeSue going to take a big leap from his freshman year or sophomore year? Is Scotty Pippen? Can they? Can Pippen go from a what ten point game score or whatever he was to to a thirteen or fourteen? Can DeSue be more consistent? Uh, is DJ Harvey? Uh, we've heard good things about, but the and this is not a original thought. But the the I've heard, you know you hear people say the college basketball landscape is littered with uh, redshirt all Americans guys. You hear great things about sitting out, so you know he's got to prove it. Um, if one of those guys emerges as they stand out then you really kind of you can recalibrate expectations a little bit Cleavon Brown who at times looked good early this year before he got hurt does another year in this system well he can he take off so I I I think this is the range of wins for this team is you know what, what do you think four at the bottom you know in the SEC to 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 10 I mean can this be a 500 team or better than this? I think it could be if things if things happen the right way. I just I, it's an interesting roster. I just really don't know what to expect. But I think the key is some guys taking a big step forward that that they haven't done yet. I would go more along the lines of three to seven. Again, I think it depends on the guards and how ready they are right away. I think that they've got a huge hole in. Well, no, they don't because they've got Cleveland Brown, but they're not great in the post. I mean. I understand that they made improvement last year and people got excited and the floor or the bar was virtually on the floor for last year, which it should have been. But they were still, I think, Ken Palm 188 at the end of the year, somewhere along those lines. So that to me is still a team that's got a good jump or two to make before it's really competitive considering that it lost Saban Lee. Where am I wrong with that? I mean, I may be, but... I, I think I see it as a bigger leap than most people do. Yeah, well, they finished 166 and 169 in Ken Palm 
And obviously, as you know, that's a season long thing. So they got clearly better. I mean, in January, that was a bad team. In February, it was a decent team. And then by the end of the season, it, you know, it was still, you know, played a lot better. Uh, we talked the year, you know, go down to Tennessee, you lose by four. The Georgia lose at the buzzer there. Missouri home game, that's the one they, you know, Missouri and Ole Miss took a couple steps back, but then Alabama and South Carolina, those were two bubble teams, ended their season. So showed some progress, obviously losing Saban Lee. Um, so that's the type of jump I'm talking. Like Saban Lee went from a good college basketball player to a great college basketball player. Can Vanderbilt have some guys take a leap? You know, I don't think they're going to have a guy average 19 points like Saban Lee did. Um, so uh, I just think that, you know, again, this was a team that had two – to three walk-ons playing valuable minutes in some SEC games, and you're just, you're not going to see that. And that just they, they they became a very easy team to defend when you, when you've got guys in there who are just not even looking at the basket. It, it, other than when Georgia had you know uh, Edwards guarding uh, Drew Weikert for a couple of possessions, and then they probably re- finally realized that they didn't need to guard him. Uh, you know, change their defense. So um, it, I think on paper this is the team you pick last in the SEC. I get it. You know, for the last 18 years I was in a business where we made predictions every year and, you know, I haven't looked at every team yet, but I would imagine Vanderbilt would be picked last in the SEC. Uh, but again, I think the roster, the, the overall talent, the overall roster depth is much better than it was last year. Well, it depends on schedule too, uh, because every year they get Kentucky, Tennessee, Florida twice, which those are potentially the best three teams in the league next year. So right there, if, if that holds, then that's a little bit of trouble. I think Jeff Goodman, I want to say, had nine, maybe ten SEC teams in his preseason top 50 that he put out a few weeks ago. Uh, Kentucky's gotten a little bit better since then uh, with the addition of Olivier Saar, although that may or may not materialize. But point is, that's those are teams, if you're top 50, you're either in the NCAA tournament or borderline NIT, and I don't think the teams outside that are bad either. So to me, a lot of it depends on how that schedule falls for them. Yeah, I would say the SEC is deep next year, but not great at the top. You know, Tennessee and Kentucky on paper appear to be the two best teams, and they are kind of fringe. You know, Kentucky's probably higher in most polls, but Tennessee's been 10 to 15 range. Uh, so I think there's a lot of good teams, but probably a lot of teams in that 15 to 40 range, not necessarily a lot of legit preseason top 25 teams. In other words, almost exactly what the Big Ten was last year. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's just uh, no easy games, but maybe no no very few sure death games where you've got no chance to win. I look at their roster for the future years, and again, I can see a path with guards and wings where they've got a chance to be fairly competitive if things pan out. And, of course, D.J. Harvey – would be in that conversation, too. They have him for two more years. To me, the thing that they've got to get is a post. And they had a good chance to land one. Again, just didn't with Romello White. I don't necessarily put that on Vanderbilt or the coaching staff. But I look at their post for the future. Of course, they lose Cleavon Brown after this year. We don't know what Quentin Malore Brown is yet. DeSue, to me, is more of a four who's more of a, a wing guy because of his outside shot I don't necessarily think of him as a post player so then it's what can Obina give them the next two years again what's Malora Brown Odisipe I hear is more along the lines of six seven six eight so I don't see him as a true post again it's not a deal breaker in college basketball these days but to me that's going to be a big x factor for them who they can develop if those guys are capable and who they can recruit on top of it. Yeah, I think Melora Brown is going to be key. You know, I've talked to people in the program that think he's going to help him next year um, that were surprised. I was surprised how tall he was. He's obviously not big, but I think he's a legit 6'10". Uh, so he will be a key next year. I think the fact that Cleveland Brown coming back helps that, you know, probably Melora Brown comes off the bench here. Here's the starting lineup that I think that, you know, you'll see. It's Pippen, Evans, Harvey, DeSume, and Brown. Do you kind of agree with that one? Let's see. Pippen for sure. Harvey for sure. Um, I can't see Max Evans not starting as a senior. Uh, I, you you might be right. I mean, again, you're dealing with a coach who had a different philosophy of how he subbed in last year. So I sure, think that's sure. a 
and he was not afraid to put one of his one best of the guys who started because of his defense. Right, right. I mean, I think you're probably right. I think that the upside is higher with their other guards. And again, we don't know if McBride is even going to be eligible yet. I mean, to me, I would think he should be for three or four reasons, but it's the NCA, so God only knows. That's another wild card, too, is is he available or is he not available? But, yeah, I mean, I think you're probably right. I think if he started last year, the inclination is going to be to start him next year, and then maybe you get a chance at your first sub to bring some firepower at guard off the bench and not drop off so much. Yeah, and then, yeah, so there's, uh, yeah, again, looking at the depth chart, and it's just not as many, I would call, weak spots as, as, as in the last two years. Anything else on hoops before we hit the mailbag? Um, I think that's it. Today's mailbag is sponsored by Mark Gent of Simply a Fan. Mark organizes road trips to sporting events across the country and will do so for Vanderbilt. Once play resumes, go to simplyafan.com to get more information. Tell Mark you heard about it on this podcast. Anchor Down 18 says, with the loss of Saban Lee, who will be the go-to guy to get a bucket if necessary? There's lots of optimism around Harvey, but I don't want to necessarily anoint him. Just kind of what we were talking about, who steps up. Um, you know, Pippen showed the ability to get to the basket last year. Not not like Saban Lee, definitely doesn't have that type of quickness, but showed some savvy. Um, I, I'd say right now from uh, Pippen or Harvey, uh, you know, I think DeSue is is very skilled. Um, I think he needs to, you know, he, he's a guy that I look at that doesn't necessarily have one strength, but I don't know how many weaknesses he has either. Uh, you know, I think he's a pretty well-rounded kid, a lot of different skill sets and, you know, he's good, surprisingly good shot blocker. I'd say, I'd say Pippen or Harvey right now. Well, last we heard on Harvey, he was a guy that was, I want to say 38, 39% shooter from the field. Effective field goal percentage would be a little bit higher than that because he hit some threes, but it wasn't great. About a 10-point-a-game score. Is that your baseline for what you think they'll get for him? I would have to think he'll get a little bit better because players' shots generally improve as their career goes longer. But what's your gut that they get from him next year? Twelve, I'd say in the 12-point range probably would be my guess. I will say this for them, that team scored a lot more points without Neesmith than I thought it would. So I do think there is some precedent there that says offensively they might be a little better than we think. Yeah, no, I agree. You, you looked After Neesmith went down, you looked some nights offensively, like where are they going to score? And they did. I mean, they scored 100 against LSU, scored 90 some in another game. So I, I totally agree with that statement. The thing that I worry about for them a little bit is that you know, when you're losing 28-29 in a row or whatever it was, I don't know that teams, just by nature, humans being humans, are going to take you as seriously. I do think that there's a little bit of built-in risk next year that since they did play better at the end of the season, that they might catch a team's best shot, or not best shot, but a better shot from some of these teams night in from night out than they were getting last year. Yeah, they still went three and fifteen. I don't you know, I don't, right. I don't know if I don't know, you know, I I think Vanderbilt's a respected program historically, but that's recent these kids that they're playing don't, you know, they know they went 0 and eighteen and three and fifteen. Let's see. View Titan says, one thing I noticed so far about the Vandy boys and the Vandy Sports 100 or how few you made it to the majors, what former baseball player or players did you think would have a great, a great pro career, but just it didn't happen so far? He says, mine are Carson Fulmer and Jaron Kendall. Yeah, I think this shows you how difficult it is to make, to make the major leagues and be a, a good player. You know, it's just... There are a lot of spots because a lot of teams, there's tons of players out there. Uh, to me, Carson Fulmer is the easy one. He still might. I mean, he's a major leaguer. He still might have a good career. But I just thought his stuff was so good and his demeanor and everything about him said major leaguer. I am not, you know, Jaron Kendall's still progressing up the food chain. But he's one that I, I just, and I'm not a scout, I just thought there's too big a hole in this 
swing. I just didn't love the fact that he struck out so much in college. And as you progress, sure, you can fix your swing. But I was just afraid that there were going to be, you know, ways to pitch to him. Um, those are those are good. I'm looking at the, the scanning the list right now. I know he got hurt. I thought Grayson Garvin was going to be a major leaguer. I think he got to triple A. Um, he's one. And then a lot of the guys are, you know, relatively young. I didn't, you know, Jason Esposito, I'm not shocked he didn't make it by any stretch. Uh, Mike Yaskrimshi, I think it's fair to say we're probably all a little surprised that, that he's done so well. And then, you know, looking at the top of the list is um, Brian Reynolds. He's a guy that I thought would definitely make it. Uh, I think Kyle Wright will be a good major leaguer. So there's still a batch that are still still have plenty of time to prove themselves. That's a good question. Yeah, and Fulmer and Kendall are two that are sort of opposites. From what I understand, part of Carson's issue is it been has been a lot of tinkering with what he does. And I think that he was having a better spring before it all got called off because I think he kind of went back to basics and what he was comfortable with. Uh, that may be taking some license there, but I believe I heard something along those lines. With Kendall, it's the opposite issue. And I have heard that they tried to work with him some at Vanderbilt where swing and miss was an issue. I don't think Jaron really wanted to change much. I think it's still been the same in the pros, and that's gotten worse. I think that he was making contact, oh, at like a 50-something percent rate his last stop in the minors, or maybe it was the AFL where he had a 50% contact rate, which is just abysmal. But it's interesting because the, the issue with both those kids have been total opposites. Yeah, in, in this era of you know home runs and strikeouts, it's – it's more acceptable, his path, but not to that extreme. You just can't have a guy, especially a speed guy like that. He would, In the Arizona Fall League, it was only 18 games. He struck out 31 times in 68 plate appearances for high A last year, which, you know, just to be in high A, it's a first-round draft pick. He struck out 147 times in 412 plate appearances. It is really interesting to look through – the people that we've honored and, and see where things fell apart. Like in some cases, it's pretty easy to explain. Like Casey Weathers had arm issues. I think Warner Jones had an issue with, what was it, his, his wrist. And I think he just lost his desire to play. So that was injury-related. As you mentioned with Grayson Garvin, that was injury-related. A few others on the list that I'm looking at, uh, Spencer Navin was one that surprised me a little bit because he was so good defensively and was considered the best catcher in the Dodgers system. And, and generally speaking, as a catcher, you'll get there because of your defense and you'll stay there if you can hit a little bit. He could hit a little bit and the defense was great. And I don't remember if there an injury was involved there or not. Ryan Mullins was one. I, I want to say an injury was in play. I'm not sure. Brian Miller was one where an injury was in play, which was surprising because of the way that he threw. Uh, you look down the list, a few more guys. Rhett Wiseman hasn't made it yet, but not too late. Connor Harrell out of baseball. And Will Toffey is another one. Toffey's had some injury issues. It's He's certainly got a couple more years to make it. Conrad Gregor was one, and we put him in our countdown at 38 today. I guess by we, I mean I, since I'm the one that's making the decisions on these. But I always thought that he had such a good approach at the plate that if he could put just a little bit more loft in his swing, which God knows that's what everybody's been doing the last few years, that he had a really good chance to make it. But he, I think he's trying to get back into pro ball. It might be a little late for him at this point because of the age. But he's one that I think is at the top of the list of people that I thought would get a crack just because his approach was so fundamentally good. And I thought that the things that he needed to do, he could do. I mean, he was a guy that hit a lot of doubles to the gap and off the wall and just missed some home runs. So I thought that the adjustment he needed to make wasn't a huge one, but it really never panned out. Yeah, I'll give you two, and I'm one, his name escapes me. I'm, that's why I've, I've been Googling. 
Well, Caleb Cotham, who Cotham, who made it, for, you know, for a little bit. I thought he was a really good college pitcher, um, and I thought he had major league stuff. And then, who's the outfielder? Early Corbin era, two thousand four, five, probably. I think he was a local kid. His dad or his uncle was like a Twins assistant. He was a left-handed thing, just a sweet swing outfielder, sweet swing. Do you remember Steven, who I'm talking about? Steven Little. Yeah, and yeah. I thought he had a shot to make it as well. I thought he had a major league swing. I just I thought he was going to make it. Yeah, I was with you. I was a little surprised, and I cannot remember if injury was the deal there or not. Yeah, I, I remember Little. LID, I think he's a coach somewhere. Steven Little, 2009 through 13, he got to – just. Uh, maybe we were just wrong. He got as high as A ball, high A, that's it, and – now, I don't think he played that long. I think it was no. maybe two or three years. Five, 2009 through 13, he ended up his career as a 244 hitter in the minors. His second year in the minors in A ball, he hit 15 home runs in 253, but then really no power after that. So good thing we weren't you know, getting paid to scout him because uh, in the early years, he was one of my favorite players as far as just, just, just looked like a baseball player. Well, and that is where age may have been a factor, too, because he redshirted at Vanderbilt. And then I he believe— was 21 in his first year in the minors. Yeah, and that's a big thing. There's a big difference between, at those ages, every year that you go up, it makes a big difference. And maybe that's why he looked a little bit better at Vanderbilt, because when he was a sophomore, he'd had that redshirt year. Yeah. Was he a local kid, Brentwood, I think? I believe he was. His— yeah, Brentwood. I believe yeah. his uncle was a big star at Lipscomb in the 80s. And then I think his uncle, like you said, was a big league coach with the Twins, which yeah. I believe was the organization, I think you said, that drafted him. Yeah, so yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Anything that stood out to you on the Vandy Sports 100? I will read the ones that I think we've done since we last broadcast. Conrad Gregor, 38. Zach Stacy 39. Jensen Lewis, 40. Followed by Wade Baldwin, Jermaine Beal, Jonathan Goff, Justin Geisinger, Will Toffey, Grayson Garvin, Kyle Shermer, and Andre Howell. I don't remember if we talked about Shermer or Howell. I remember we had the Azili Cornette debate on the last podcast, so I think we've covered all the bases of the ones that we may not have talked about. Any thoughts on any of those guys, Mitch? Yeah, I would, and this is similar situation. We had two guys at the same position back-to-back, so we don't want to spend too much time, but I would have... Definitely had Jermaine Beal ahead of Wade Baldwin. Yeah, and I will tell you my thinking on that one, okay? Uh, I The way that I generally do it is I look at the career and say, okay, if you know on signing day that this is what you're getting out of this player, um, not that you can, but you know, how, how, in other words, if you know, I guess a better way to put it, if you know after a guy's career is over, this is what you got out of him, how do you rate him? Now, where I do make some exceptions – or when a guy is old enough to leave for the pros, which Baldwin was after his sophomore year, which I think is the only guy in Vanderbilt basketball history that I ever remember doing that, and he was drafted number 17 overall. Uh, With with Beal, obviously, he never made the NBA and stayed around until his senior year. So the reason I did those guys, I think Beal had a more valuable career at Vanderbilt, but the thing was, if you put Baldwin in the same spot and have him stay four years – he ends up probably their all-time assist leader and their top five in scoring with the snowball's chance or better than that, actually, to end up their leading scorer. That's why I flipped those guys was because it was age to age. Beal was nowhere near the player that Baldwin was as a freshman and sophomore, and I presume that that progression would have continued if he'd stayed two more. Yeah, I would, good points. I'll counter that. Beal played on a better better teams earlier in his career, so wasn't needed to be as good. You know, he was on his Sweet 16 team his freshman year, played 34 games, averaged 17 minutes a game, and then was a three-year starter, played on three NCAA tournament teams. Um, you know, senior year averaged 14 points and three assists, averaged 4.6 assists his sophomore year. Very clutch um, hit. What would have been, I think, was a 2000, the year they lost to Murray State in the tournament, hit uh, two go, uh, go-ahead free throws that would have, you know, that gave Vanderbilt the lead until Murray State hit the, hit the game winner at the buzzer. Uh, was very clutch throughout his career. I think was probably more of a team guy. You know, Baldwin 
depending on who you believe or talk to, and it kind of caught up to him in the NBA, wasn't the best teammate at times. So I, I was just always a big Jermaine Beal fan. And you sort of just outlined the reasons why, but I will agree with you on this for sure. I just felt like if you could go back and take one of those guys in a random game based on what they did at Vanderbilt and said, all right, I want this guy with the ball in his hands, last possession to win a big game, I would have trusted Beal to do that more than I would have Baldwin. Yeah, and Bill, and not just to just to make the right play too, whether it was a pass or a shot. Um, yeah, so again, Wade Baldwin, very talented kid, and you know was a what fringe top one hundred recruit who was good enough to be a first round draft pick. So had a had a good two year run and made a lot of clutch plays for Vanderbilt that year. They you know made the NCAA tournament. So I don't want to take anything away. I just that just stuck out to me because I've, I've always been a big Jermaine Beal fan. I had Justin Geisinger at 44, and that was a hard one to do. Basically, the case was based on this, right? He was a four-year starter at left tackle, which is a premium position. He played it exceptionally well. I think he gave up seven sacks his whole career. Now, he was more of a guard-type body and was not very fast. I think he ran a 5-4, but he got by on brute strength. Uh, That was kind of a dart throw, but what do you think about where I had him? Very hard to judge offensive linemen, like as we've talked about, especially didn't really do anything in the NFL. I think he played for a few years, but you know, I, I'm, I, excuse me, I'm with you. You're, you're a four year star left tackle on any SEC team, and you have those stats. You're a pretty good player. So, um, sorry, I was eating an apple in every, well, in between questions and went down the wrong way. Um, that's good podcast information right there. So I, I have no problem with Justin Geisinger being, you know, I don't, was he ever decorated? Was he ever all SEC maybe as a senior? I don't know. But uh, he was clearly one of the better offensive linemen the school's had in the last 20 years. Yeah, he made an all SEC team, I want to say second, once, maybe twice. But um, again, left tackle puts you in pretty good company. If you're not getting your quarterback killed, then that's a huge feather in your cap. Two that I thought I would get pushback on, that I really haven't. Conrad Greger at 38, Jensen Lewis at 40. What did you think about those guys? I thought Lewis was really good in those early Corbin teams. He was a starter on a super regional team and that 05 team that kind of blew it late, you know, probably should have been a regional team. He was, I remember going to a Friday night game against Alabama and I think he won one nothing. I don't might have pitched a complete game. I thought he was a really, really good pitcher. So no problem there. And who was Gregor? Consistent offensive player for on some really good teams. I think I I would have no you know, without looking at the numbers comparing some other similar players, like right? the consistency the word there. I'm looking, you have Will Toffee at 45, Conrad Gregor much more consistent. Toffee at his best was better, but Gregor was a good player for for longer. I was thinking about this on Jensen Lewis. That 2004 team, when he was in the rotation, which I believe they moved him back to the bullpen late that year. I could be wrong, but I think that's, in fact, I I think that's what happened. But if you go Sowers, Mullins, Lewis, that is debatably as good a one, two, three as they had in Tim Corbin's era. Now, that seems weird to say because the talent's gotten a lot better, but I think that rotation rotation has a very strong case. And we tend to define rotations by top end, and Sowers was certainly great. He was an all American, but it is hard to find a three as good as Jensen Lewis. Mitch, did I lose you there? Sorry, I put it on mute while you were talking, so I could chew my apple, and I didn't. Uh, I didn't hit unmute there. Who was the? Um, but I was listening to. Who was the three? I'm drawing a blank. In 07, you had Price on a Friday night. Sa- uh, Mike Miner was Saturday, right? Was it? You talking about Tyler- in 07? Yeah. Who was? Was it Tyler Brown? Uh, Not Tyler Brown. Was it Tyler Davis? No. Davis, I think, was their midweek guy. Spring they guy. split time between Crowell and Christiani, and I think Crowell was a Kroll. good bit better. Yeah, when Crowell was pitching, that was a pretty good. I was, I'm, a, I'm also a big Cody Crowell fan. I thought he was an underrated. You know, I thought he had a really good year that year. I'd have to look at his numbers, but yeah, you're right about that 04 rotation. Uh, Jensen Lewis, really solid career. Well, that team too. 
they had some really good bats at the top. They had Nicholas in the middle of the order. They had Warner Jones was an All-American that year. But the rest of that lineup, I'm trying to think of, well, Klosterman had a good year, right? And Baxter... Mansolino was pretty good. Well, he was a good defender. He, I don't think he hit a lot that year. But the way I remember it, Baxter didn't really break out to 05 when he had a super year. But he was just okay that year. Mansolino was good glove, not a great bat. They had, um, well, Jones was at second. Outfield was not very notable. Richardson was in center. Worth Scott was in right. Yeah, Richardson was a decent offensive player, but not a great one. Worth Scott was a below average offensive player, and I think they platooned and left. But point is, after about the fourth or fifth spot in the lineup, that bunch really dropped off a cliff in terms of run production. They won so many games just because those guys, one, two, three, not only were very good, but all those guys could easily get you into the seventh inning. And Mullins and Sowers uh, was not out of the ordinary for one of those two kids to throw a complete game. Yeah, Mansolino that year batted 274 with um, five home runs. Um, So... Yeah, no, I agree. That that was the early Corbin years, definitely pitching and defense. You know, last year's rotation, it wasn't vintage Vanderbilt in some ways, but if you pause it at season's end and look at where they were and you reverse things a little bit, because I think, again, we tend to define rotations by who the one is, and Fellows was the one, but if you mix that up a little bit and say you go Hickman one, Rocker two, Fellows three, just the optics of putting fellows from one to three looks a lot different. And all of a sudden that rotation's a lot more competitive in that discussion uh, than maybe we perceived at the time. Yeah. And one thing most it's rare where Corbin's teams have had a rotation all year, like this snapshot in 2014, Bueller pitched in the college world series, but he was midweek during the season. Hickman this year didn't, make the rotation until late in the year. Fulmer in 2014 was a reliever until middle of the year. So it's sometimes, you know, what we see in the postseason isn't what we saw in the regular season. I think the weirdest thing, maybe 15 years from now, when people look back on Vanderbilt baseball, is the fact that Walker Buehler didn't really make the rotation till what, his junior year? Right, yeah. Because I believe he was a midweek guy as a sophomore, and that was sort of one of those things like with Mason Hickman, like that there was definitely an argument that he belonged. But Tim is kind of a sometimes don't mess with what's working guy or maybe give a guy a chance to work things out like he did with Raby. And then once he gets postseason, it's like, okay, we're going to do what we need to do. And that's when a lot of times he makes his moves. But I think that one is going to just look really odd to people on the outside when they study Vandy baseball a decade or two from now. Yeah, it's like, yeah, he was maybe the fourth, fourth, fifth best pitcher on that team. So, right, <laughs> yeah, that, right. Definitely. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's, 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 uh, and talk of a group him and Fulmer together because they're both first round picks and Fulmer went higher. And, um, Bueller obviously had that. Uh, ACL surgery right after he was drafted, but uh, he has been he has been unbelievable as, as a major leader. Well, and back to Lewis for a minute. One thing that I liked about him is he had the flexibility to adapt to roles. He could go into your rotation and be really good, or he could go into your bullpen and close and be really good. His floor really never wavered a lot. A lot of players, even great ones, are just kind of marginal contributors as a freshman. But Lewis was a guy that contributed. At a, at a pretty good level from the time he got on campus and, and back to Conrad Gregor, he did the same thing just on the hitting side. Yeah, and obviously Tim Corbin and his staff deserves all the credit for winning games and developing those guys, but you cannot forget, you know, Rowan Muburn recruited Jeremy Sowers, Jensen Lewis, Matt Bushman, Ryan Mullins, Warner Jones, all those, you know, a core from those early teams there. He, he definitely had some arms that he recruited very well late in, the, late in his tenure. Was Bushman the midweek guy in 04? I want to say that he was. Could be. I don't remember. You know what? I can look this up, and I'm going to if you'll give me just a second. Yeah, Bushman was always a, a very underrated player in my mind. And let's see. I've got a chart 
that goes year by year. And in 04, yeah, Bushman was there four. Their bullpen that year was not very deep. They went rote to close. And then in order of innings, the rest of the bullpen was Jeff Sues, Tyler Roden, Stephen Shayall, who had a really interesting career too, was good for a year or two, then just didn't really contribute much after that. They had, I think it was Michael Wagner. I believe he was from Seattle. as a righty. They had Greg Mobile as a lefty. Uh, who didn't really pitch much and didn't pitch well and had Blake Owen. That really was a really, what would that be, about a, an eight-man pitching staff? Wagner contributed some, but there wasn't as much depth there, which, again, that put more burden on your, your one to three guys. So, to, to me, that underscores their value a little bit more. Anyway, Mitch, uh, we've talked – a lot today. I know you've got work to do. Appreciate you joining me today. Any closing thoughts before we end the podcast? Any work on your end that you would like to promote? Uh, not really. Uh, like I said, we'll have the top 10 uh, most uh, dominant teams in the state of Tennessee. You, you, over the last 50 years, you'll see a couple uh, representatives there from Vanderbilt that will be published tomorrow. And Josh Cooper's story on the early Vanderbilt baseball team, some of those guys, what they're doing in Major League Baseball uh, will be published later today. And your Twitter handle is? At Mitch Light. Thank you, Mitch. All right. Take care, Chris. He is Mitch Light. I'm Chris Lee. Thank you for listening to the Vandy Sports Podcast.